I think it's important to ask the question, what is the most destructive human behavior on planet Earth? Does anybody know? The single most destructive behavior we have environmentally. Agriculture, yes. Yeah. So, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily make ag agriculture an inherently malevolent thing or a behavior. It's just the design strategies or lack of design strategies that we apply to it. It's really a management issue. It's not, it's, agriculture is not the cause, it's the management. So, in, in permaculture design, which is ethics-based applied ecological design, we often say the problem is the solution or within the problem is the evident solution. So just like agriculture can be the most destructive thing that we're currently involved in, it can be the salvation for our species and the healing force for the planet that we need. Because what we're doing with agriculture is we're, we're obtaining a yield from photosynthetic process, right? We're employing plant species that we've domesticated over the last 10 to 15,000 years to perform functions for us. They're taking CO2 from the atmosphere, which is pretty amazing. They're drawing that down and then combining it with photons from the sun and making it into sugar, right? Which is a, a long chain carbon molecule. It's like these carbohydrates and sugars that the plants then pump down into the soil to feed the the food web down there. So if, if what we understand is that agriculture is really just us working with plants initially, right, and, and the soil that they grow in, then we realize that we can uh, seize this opportunity to be such a significant part of the carbon cycle, right? Because if these plants that we're growing on massive acreage, like for example, we've deforested probably 50% of the Earth's forests for some kind of agricultural productivity, whether it's grazing, which, which grazing, by the way, is growing grass. It's not growing livestock. Um, or, or it's arable land that we've tilled up for, for row crops. Um, but the thing to realize is that we have huge management over a lot of the landscape of this planet. And so if we can mimic the way that nature farms or the, the way that nature assembles ecosystems and apply that to the way that we grow our food crops, then we can create these really functional systems that provide ecological services and functions like building soil, sequestering atmospheric carbon, um, catching and storing rainwater, right? Driving the water cycle if we create forest ecologies that produce our food crops versus uh, monoculture grain fields that extend for miles and miles and miles, right? Instead, if we have forests, right, it's habitat for bird species. It's um, long-term carbon storage, right? Trees, as they grow, they're taking atmospheric carbon and embodying it in their limbs and in their biomass, right? So then when we start doing that on a larger and larger scale, we start affecting climate, right? So in Ojai, in the last hundred years or so, a lot of the canopy of oak trees has been lost, right? There's sort of a saying that if you were a squirrel in the early 1800s, you could go from upper Ojai or, the, or perhaps the east end to Carpinteria without touching the ground, right? So that's pretty good spacing of trees. It sounds pretty dense. It sounds pretty cool and shaded and humid and moist and life-giving, right? Because everybody here, if you've lived in Ojai long enough, you know what it's like when, when the oak tree that used to shade your house died, how much hotter your house got in the summer, or at least you've maybe heard that from someone else. Or if you just stand out in the sunlight there versus under the tree, there can be a 20 degree cooling factor between there and there, and the humidity uptick is significant underneath the tree. One tree can do what 10 air conditioning units can do for its surrounding environment. Right, so when we destroy forest to grow annual crops, like grains, 
that could be produced from tree crops like chestnuts or walnuts or hazelnuts, we change the microclimate. And when we do that on half the planet, we change the climate. Right? So this whole narrative that driving an SUV is what's causing climate change is just, it's not true. It's just not, it's not the whole truth. It's one small element of it that is particularly well designed to make people feel guilty for being consumers, but it's, it doesn't even come close to grasping at the full reality of what climate change is, nor does it approach a solution set. So, <laughs> agriculture produces significantly more carbon emissions than driving vehicles and all transportation combined. Okay. Um, reason being is that when we till landscape and we open the soil up, we expose its soil carbon to the sun. That oxidizes and goes back into the atmosphere. Right? So the scale of which we're doing that is so much larger than we can comprehend. Like covering the soil on an acre, for example, and, and hiding the soil from the sun is like taking one vehicle off the road for an entire year in carbon, in carbon dioxide savings that would otherwise go into the atmosphere. Does that make sense? <clears throat> right, and so these vast reaches of landscape throughout the middle of our country have been overturned and thousands of years worth of stable carbon's gone into the atmosphere. That's way more than is coming out of you know, the tailpipe of the suburban driving down the street or the combined effect of all of us doing that. So anyhow, we have to take agriculture and switch it from something that is degenerating soil carbon, right, which contributes to climate change, that's dismantling the fabric of ecosystems and reducing biodiversity and dehydrating aquifers for irrigation, we have to flip that and turn it to regenerative. We have to look back a hundred years and say, what did this landscape look like? What were the plant communities? How much water was in the aquifer? What were the soil carbon levels in this environment? What were the biodiversity levels looking like? What species were here? You know, how many tens of thousands of steelhead used to make it to the upper part of this watershed in the 1950s? And then we have to design from that point to a future that resembles that while we can still cohabitate in a cohesive way. And the only way we can do that is to change our land, land management practices. And the majority of what we do on land is farm, right? Agriculture makes up about 7,000 acres in the Valley of Ojai, right? So if we turn that to a regenerative system, just on 7,000 acres, for example, we could infiltrate enough water, uh, the equivalent amount of water that we demand from Lake Casitas annually. Right, so it's a lot of information to unpack and I'd <laughs> I'm not sure how much, I guess I've got a minute left. <laughs> um, I thought I had more time than that, oh well. Um, so anyhow, if we have agricultural systems that model nature, that sequester carbon, that increase biodiversity, uh, increase the quality and quantity of water in the soil and the water table, then we can continue to persist as a species. But if we continue on the trajectory we're at now, we're going to destroy all of our resources and we're going to die. And it's a pretty unfortunate scenario, but it's kind of the nature of things. And if you look throughout history, agricultural societies that based all of their productivity on annual grains and broad acre management like that have collapsed. So we just look back 10,000 years and you can see the end game of every civilization that behaved similarly to ours. So we just need to make this shift. Am I, am I done? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, the how, the how is observing nature, right? The how is applying ethics in design. The how is looking at, like I said, those those uh, historic baselines for soil carbon, biodiversity, and water availability, right? We have to model the communities of plants that exist here. Like we have oak savanna. That's the predominant biome for this area. 
So if we can model an agricultural system that has large trees that produce high calorie products like acorns, but you don't have to leach them, and we space them every 30 to 60 feet, and then manage the understory with grazing animals, we have an, an analogous agricultural system to what this landscape would want to be if people left. Right? And so that gets a lot closer to approaching that kind of ecological function that this particular landscape needs to have. And the food from deep-rooted, well-aged trees like this, the nutrient density of that is way higher than uh, grain that has, you know, a two-foot deep root system that's been growing in impoverished soil, right? This has the complex interaction with fungi and mycorrhiza that are mining the earth, the, the, the rocky material b beneath the tree and feeding it, injecting it right into the root system. So this tree has billions of interactions happening in its root system. That adds, that all adds up to an extremely nutrient-dense product.